with that, let me quickly turn to uh, Rival Long Island, uh, who we are, what we are, what we do. Uh, the, the core for Rival Long Island, we are a relatively new organization. We've been around for maybe uh, three years, uh, first as a community group, and then last year we formally became a, a, a nonprofit. Earlier this year, we got our 501c3 certification. Uh, all volunteers emphasizing sustainable landscaping with uh, biodiversity. What does that mean? Right now, we are thinking about you know centering around four practices. Right, one the first is planting native perennials that support a wide variety of species that have co-evolved with them and consume fewer resources. So the first is, of course, centering around native perennials. And the important thing is to stop thinking of plants as things in our environment and really think of them as living beings which connect to one another and to other uh, species as well. So that's, that, that's the mindset around native perennials and the biodiversity. Second is using our land to grow produce for ourselves and our community, whether it's private spaces that we have in our yards or public community spaces, using these spaces to um, grow food, grow organic produce, that is very important, uh, simply because we eat them and you know uh, the community, especially in times of COVID, with all the food crisis and the stress that is going on, this is definitely something that uh, is worthwhile to, to uh, help ourselves and others. Our third is building soil and conserving water. We all know, right? I mean, native plants sequester native plants and native trees and vegetation sequesters carbon naturally. So being able to build that soil. So if you're in a rocky, sandy space or you're in a good space, whatever it is, I mean, just helping yourself build that soil is the first step towards growing good food or growing uh, good plants and conserving water, right? While you're on that space, think about our aquifer, think about how, uh, Long Island gets its water, make sure it's not running off, make sure the concrete is not overwhelming everything else and protect the environment. The last is composting and recycling. Basically, we generate a lot of yard waste, we lot generate a lot of kitchen waste and other waste. Um, primarily pulling, putting a lot of this back into the soil helps everything about it, right? Helps to build soil, helps to retain water, helps you to grow organic produce and helps you with uh, your native perennials that you're planting. So it's all connected, uh, this idea of sustainable landscaping and uh, with, with, with an emphasis on biodiversity. So that's kind of what we do, uh, or, or what are the main practices that we are here to foster. Uh, and, and, you know, this is pretty much common sense. The question really that comes out to us is, oh, you know, everybody wants to do this pretty much. I don't, I don't know anybody that says, give me a chemical lawn or uh, give me something that's a monoculture or, oh, you know, I love toxic, uh, <laughs> I love the smell, I love the sound of uh, lawnmowers and uh, leaf blowers on my property. Nobody likes that, but, you know, we don't have alternatives right now because we are enmeshed in a conventional complex way of doing things, which is centered around fossil fuels, centered around a certain kinds of missionary, certain, centered around some exotic monocultures that come from various places. So that's how we do it. And, and also our aesthetic is tied into how we think of a pretty house. Go buy a house, we think, oh, it has a beautiful lawn, it has setback, it's this, you know, a, a million sex, right? I mean, we, you know, some, of the, some of the aesthetics that we associate with um, prettiness and beauty are unfortunately tied up with the wrong sense of green in, in our environment. And what we are trying to do is educate the community this is a webinar is a good example of that, right? Educating the community, then enabling access. So, you know, whether it is uh, having access to more native plants, whether it is having access to more experts like Anthony to uh, advise people, whether it is um, right uh, plant sales, things like that that we do. And then the third is ecosystem. You know, you have to build an ecosystem, and the ecosystem is not just plants, ecosystem of plants, but there's an ecosystem of people and institutions that go with it that is very important, ranging from people who, you know, uh, nurseries who grow these plants to retail establishments around us, to consultants, to landscapers, to landscaping equipment, uh, government regulations, neighborhood associations, you know, all those things need to come in in order to make 
a sustainable landscape possible. And so that's the, the, those are the three main uh, uh, modes under which we operate, which is education, enabling access and building ecosystems. Right? So that's kind of what we are trying here to do. Um, very uh, quickly, what, you know, so, so one of the things I would say is absolutely as you go through the webinar, as you um, do the rewilding, if you want to connect back into us, become a member, join us, please do, right? I mean, we are looking for people to, right now we are centered largely around Port Washington because of, that's where a lot of the initial uh, folks that founded it were, but we are happy to open. If you have three, four, five neighbors who are willing to work on this together, bring them on and we are happy to work with you, create a chapter, you know, uh, expand our activities. Um, this is what we typically do. Our year starts in October, it's all I you know, I think about it because this is, you know, not winter, but this is planning season. Everything starts with planning. So you have to start a garden with planning and thought. And this is when we plan our winter plant in spring. We start now, uh, then come April, we will, you know, wherever uh, possible, we'll be doing mulching as a group that is ordering group mulch and having it delivered in wherever, you know, cardboard mulch. And um, Anthony will talk about it, uh, why this is necessary for those who are sort of restarting or uh, uh, planting a garden. And then uh, in May, we do our native plant sales and education. Uh, we continue to work on a native plant garden at the Dodge Homestead uh, here in Port Washington. Uh, and then we do a variety of activities, including our summer program to fight hunger and climate change. We had 17 uh, uh, volunteer, student volunteers this summer. They grew about 2,000 to 3,000 pounds of uh, food here in public spaces uh, in and around, uh, you know, uh, Port Washington, the Kalnick Peninsula. It was awesome. They, they, you know, this was really, really committed young people who did an awesome job. And then now uh, we did our fall sale in September, and now we are here back at the beginning of the year. So I just wanted to put a plug in, talk about what we are doing as an organization and, you know, uh, why we are doing what we are doing. Uh, I'll come back. If anybody has questions, you can ask me at the end. Uh, no problem. But what I'm going to do now is, you know, sort of like kicking off our new year <laughs> with some very good education. We are very, very happy to partner with Anthony, uh, Anthony and Drop Seed Natives. I mean, we are, Anthony is just amazing font of information for us. He's been really, um, you know, uh, many of you know him from the Facebook group as well uh, and, and know how knowledgeable he is, how helpful he is. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Anthony uh, to talk to us about how to create and maintain a beautiful native garden starting this spring. Anthony. Okay, thank you, Raju. Uh, I'd like to thank Rewild again for having me and thank you everybody for joining today. Um, let me just get my screen shared as soon as Raju's done. Okay. Okay. Oh wait, this is not the right one. One second, pulled up the wrong, pulled up the wrong webinar today. Let me know that. when you give that one, though. I would like to go to that one. <laughs> that one, actually, I gave over the um, summer to the Brentwood Library, and I'm in the process of getting that for myself so I can share it with everybody. Right now, they don't allow me to share it for some reason. Okay, so this is ours today. Are we... No, you're not sharing yet. And here we go. Okay. All right, can't see it. Thank you. Okay, so today we'll talk about designing a native planted garden. I'm gonna share some methods and techniques for success. So Raju already spoke a little bit about rewilding. Here is a little bit of a more textbook definition, um, a form of environmental conservation and ecological restoration that has significant potential to increase biodiversity, create self-sustainable environments and mitigate climate change. Um, rewilding in my opinion is the answer to many of today's problems that we are experiencing environmentally. So why is this important? Um, I'm sure many of you through the years of living on Long Island or living wherever you may have been, have seen either forests be cut down for a new development or some sort of wild land in your own neighborhood be transformed into concrete and bricks. Um, the more this happens, the less habitat we have for wildlife in our 
local ecosystem. So rewilding helps us bolster those populations, get all the native plants back into our communities. And we can do that while still building our own communities, as long as we incorporate these native plants to also foster the wildlife that lives alongside us. So how can you help? You can help by rewilding your own yard and garden. Um, you can start small and expand big. I like to tell everybody the goal is to have no lawn if you can and to plant as many native plants as you possibly can. Choosing native plants supports the ecosystem at the base foundation. So all of the insects that feed on your native plants then go forward to feed the higher life forms such as songbirds, amphibians, lizards, what have you, that may be living within your garden. So where do you begin? You should know your region. So Long Island is smack dab in the middle of the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic regions. Um, so because of that, we actually have plant communities from both the Northeast and the Mid-Atlantic regions. Many of our Mid-Atlantic species top out their Northern limit on Long Island and many of our Northeastern species bottom out at their Southern limit on Long Island. So we have kind of the best of both worlds. And because of that, we're also a very mild climate. So our growing season is a little bit extended compared to the other regions around us. Um, but it's also important to know our localized ecoregions, which Long Island has about three or four localized ecoregions. Um, each ecoregion is unique in its own way. Um, starts a lot of times with the soil and geology of each section of each ecoregion. So the eastern end of Long Island was developed, was dropped off by the glaciers at a different time than the southern side of Long Island, as well as the northern side. So there's a map coming up that I will show you the different ecoregions. So this is the ecoregion map that is provided by New York State. And this shows the Long Island Sound coastal forest, which pretty much exists from all the way west in Brooklyn to along the North Shore, all the way out almost to the, the end of the North Fork and then comes back down to almost where Jamaica Bay is. Then you have the Cape Cod Long Island Pine Barrens, which as the name suggests, actually extends from Cape Cod and Massachusetts through Long Island and then kind of continues also through New Jersey. And we also have the Barrier Island coastal marsh ecosystem, which is all along our South shore, which is our coastal marshes, our sand dunes. Um, a lot of our pine barrens also exist within these regions. Historically, pine barrens existed from Jamaica Bay all the way through to where the pine barrens now exist. There's also another ecoregion I like to talk about in Nassau County, which is the Hempstead Plains ecoregion, which is pretty much the most endangered ecosystem we have in New York and high up on the list of world uh, ecoregions and ecosystems that are endangered. It exists only in a small parcel of land now adjacent to NASA Community College, and it is upkept with the help of volunteers. If you have the time to go check that out, I highly suggest it. And if you live in the region, along Hempstead Turnpike, um, from like Jamaica, uh, Jericho Turnpike south to like Hempstead Turnpike in central Nassau County, you historically would have been Tallgrass Prairie, the only Tallgrass Prairie east of the Allegheny River. So a lot of people nowadays are scared to plant trees with increasing hurricanes. And if you live in central Nassau, you may want to opt instead for Tallgrass Prairie in your property. So be an educated consumer. You wanna become familiar with the botanical names of native species. It also helps to become familiar with the botanical names of non-native and invasive species. Um, you wanna know the true natural range of plants. Many plants that are labeled as native on the shelf are not native to our actual region. They're cultivated varieties that are native to, or they're also cultivated varieties which may be of native species, but they aren't gonna function the same way as the true straight native species would function. Um, other things that are happening are native plants that are native to either the Midwest, the Southeast or the Southwest are also being toted as native because they're being shipped across the country. So it's easier for a nursery to just say, send me anything labeled native than it is for them to do their own research and say, no, that species shouldn't be growing here. It should be growing down South. And I'd prefer the native species for the Northeast. Um, also, know the growth habit and the reproductive strategy of your plants. And many times that's where people will make the mistake where the plant may, the individual plant may grow just fine, 
but then three years later, two or three years later, when the plants start reproducing, you run into trouble where you have a lot of volunteers popping up in places you never wanted them, taking over sections of the of your garden that you might not have planned for them to be. So always know how your plant's going to reproduce besides just how that individual plant's going to mature. You wanna avoid cultivars, which are cultivated varieties. You wanna avoid nursery hybrids because they do not function as similarly to the straight species within the ecosystem as you would like them to. So I will touch upon that topic later on as well. So BONAP, which is an acronym and the New York Flora Atlas, these maps are the best maps in my opinion for figuring out which species is native where. Um, so BONAP is the biota of North America, North American plants. Um, so this is the BONAP map for Echinacea purpurea, which is purple coneflower. A lot of people in the Northeast and actually everywhere plant purple coneflower and black eyed Susan as our token native plants. Um, they are not native to the Northeast. They're only native to the Midwestern shortgrass prairie states and a little bit into the tall grass prairie states as well. Um, so these are not truly native to, north, uh, to the Northeast. And if you can see the green is where they're native to, the yellow is where they're rare, the orange is where they've been ext extirpated. So they actually no longer grow wild in this state. And then if you can see in the Northeast, these blue counties, that's where they've been introduced and are now growing wild on their own. So taking a plant from the Midwest, growing it in the Northeast does give it the ability to become actually invasive here even though it's native to North America. So you wanna pay attention to which plants belong in our ecoregion and ecosystem. You don't wanna be planting plants from out of our ecoregion. They do support generalist pollinators. They do support songbirds because the same songbird communities that are here may exist here along with the same insects that may exist in the Northeast may exist also in the Midwest. But you do wanna focus on preserving what we have in the Northeast instead of replacing it with plants from a different region. Um, I actually spoke to Douglas Tallamy on the subject because I wanted to clarify some stuff for my Facebook group. And he said to only use plants within a 200 mile radius of where you are, where your home sits. So really we're focusing on New Jersey, a little bit of New York and Massachusetts and Connecticut really is where we wanna focus on. So techniques, the easiest thing to do is to work with what you have. So your current beds, if there's empty spaces in between your plants, you can fill them with ground covers. Um, definitely identify and remove any non-native species that you're also growing. If they're invasive, they should be high up on your list. Um, privet is, a, is one that a lot of people grow that's invasive. You should definitely plan on removing that. Um, barberry is another one that I believe now is actually illegal to sell in New York State finally because they are turning our wild forest into monocultures of just barberry. And they also um, create perfect habitat for ticks. So they're causing a health problem to a health concern for much of the Northeast. So they have become, they have been put on the New York state do not sell list, which hopefully that will be populated with many more exotic species in the years to come. Um, Japanese maple is another one that they are working on every day now to uh, document where they are popping up in our wildlands and to put that as well onto the do not plant, do not sell list. Um, for those wishing to decrease the size of their lawn and create a larger native garden, there are a few techniques that will make it a little easier for you. So three main techniques are sheet mulching, solarization, and island gardens. And we'll talk about all of them. So sheet mulching is also known as lasagna oh, yeah. gardening. For those That's who may be familiar with um, with vegetable gardening perhaps, they call it lasagna gardening. So usually with vegetable gardening, you would come in in the fall and you'd lay in all your dead leaves, grass clippings, newspaper, whatever you have, and layer that on and let that break down to, per, to cover your soil through the winter, but then also provide fresh, pretty much compost at, at the start of the spring. So you wanna do something similar with the, with the sheet mulching technique. Um, it's great for larger areas that are already growing plants or unwanted plants. So if you have grass growing and you wanna convert that into a new native garden, this is my go-to method. It's easy to do, it's low cost to use recyclable, you know, used recycled cardboard. Um, and it's also low labor. You don't have to go out there with a shovel or a hoe and rip out all your grass. So you can just cover over it very quickly. It also increases the fertility of the soil, which sometimes isn't a good thing for native plants. 
um, sometimes it is a good thing depending on what you're trying to plant. So, and again, it is my preferred method for getting a native bed started. So here's an example of sheet mulching. Literally all you do is lay down cardboard, you overlap it a little bit, you lay down the cardboard where you want your garden bed to be and you pile on the top soil, compost or mulch up to layers of three inches thick. And then you let that sit and settle. And what that does is it will smother whatever is growing underneath it most of what is growing underneath it. So you wanna go with unwaxed, grease-free cardboard or newspaper. You don't wanna be using waxed produce boxes that help keep the moisture out. Um, that wax will not break down in your soil and may cause some problems. You also wanna go grease-free. You don't wanna be using pepperoni-tainted pizza boxes because that will also cause some problems in your soil and prevent it from breaking down in a, in a timely manner. Um, topsoil or compost or mulch. I like topsoil. Mulch is also a good good um, topper to, to use with this technique. Compost is also very good, especially if you are converting a chemical laden lawn to a new native planting. And I, this is probably the only time I would recommend compost because what you want to do with the compost is recolonize that dead soil that is used to being, it's pretty much the way we take care of our lawns is pretty much making them um, hydroponic almost where the soil is dead and we're constantly putting in chemicals and irrigating. So by allowing that compost to go on top, you are reinvigorating the soil with beneficial bacteria, microbes, um, fungus, all the good stuff that makes soil different than dirt. So that's the only time I may say to put some compost on your native plants just to give them a nice little up, uptick with the soil and, and get that life started in there. Um, so the other thing is some leaves, twigs, long clippings, other yard debris, you can layer that on as you see fit. And the goal is to just smother the unwanted vegetation and you create a fresh bed for planting. Um, you apply the cardboard, like I said, cover it with the layers of soil or mulch, two to three inches thick, and you just let that sit. Um, usually it's recommended to wait a few weeks to a month just so that everything really rots underneath and everything settles. But if you're um, you know, stressed for time, you can plant immediately in this situation. And then you just watch to see if anything is growing through where you happen to cut through the cardboard to plant your new plants. Solarization is also another great technique. It takes a little longer to achieve these results. Um, the goal in this is to neutralize the existing plants that are growing in the soil. So this um, technique actually has the ability to kill off some of the harder plants to get rid of. So anything that's has a bulb in it or anything that maybe has a, a strong tap root. So if you're dealing with um, wild field garlic, which is a Eurasian species, or if you're dealing with broadleaf dock in your, in your property um, and you can't dig that, you're not able to, to dig that root out, or you can't find every little bulb that happens to be growing in your soil. This is a great method because um, this will pretty much cook your soil and kill off any seeds and any roots that are within that soil layer. Um, it's great for starting metals from seed since it will sterilize all the seed weeds that are laying dormant within your soil so that your fresh native plant seeds will not have competition. So a checklist for solarization is heavy duty black or clear plastic sheeting. You want stakes or bricks to hold the sheeting in place and time. It's best done in the spring through the summer because you need the heat of the sun. Um, you wouldn't do this in the fall or you wouldn't do this through the winter. Uh, and again, the goal is the plastic sheeting absorbs and traps the solar radiation from the sun. And then that effectively brings the soil to a high enough temperature to sterilize, sterilize any seeds as well as kill off any roots. And after this, you may want to apply some compost to help recolonize the soil with uh, beneficial bacteria and fungus as well. So the island gardens. Island gardens are great for people who want to start small. You really don't know where to begin. You have a lot of lawn area and you maybe just want to do a little accent in the corner. Um, they're also great for areas where maybe your neighbors might freak out a little bit or, or get a little excited about the fact that you just covered over your whole lawn. So you might want to start small with a little corner or maybe you know just one little section in the center. Um, the first, either of the first few methods will work when creating an island garden, uh, depending on how big your garden, you know, the island garden is going to be, you may just opt to, you know, just dig out the little bit of grass that you have, pile up some topsoil to make a nice berm and then plant. Otherwise, you can use either of the other two techniques and get started that way. 
So here's an example. Um, these plants aren't native plants. Some of them may be native plants, but for the most part, I just wanted to show an example of a, an island garden. So usually, you know, there's a nice shape to it, a little crescent design, or, you know, even just a perfect circle. And they are quite often built up a little bit with a berm and you just go plant and it's a great little accent. Um, it breaks up the monotony of the lawn and it is definitely more formal of, of the gardens if you want to go with an island garden. It definitely looks very ornamental when designed properly. So some tips for designing a native garden. The goal of the garden is to recreate a natural plant community you might find in the wild. That means allowing the plants to intermingle and meander and fill in the space as the plants would under natural conditions. Many gardens, especially traditional gardens, we plant a plant here, we plant a plant, you know, two feet in the other direction and we fill it in with mulch. If you go out in nature, you will not see that. You will either see plants growing directly on top of plants, intermingling different species which form communities, or you will see, you know, leaf litter in it between it. For, for the most part, you're going to see plants on top of plants forming communities. You're not going to see bare soil and you're not going to see, you know, foot upon foot of wood mulch or leaf mulch. You're just going to see plants. Um, so again, you're, you're, you you want to go for a resilient plant community and the, the more dense you plant, the more resilient that community is going to be right up the bat and the quicker they're going to establish. So some important things to keep in mind again are ecoregion, um, your growing conditions, layering and maintenance. So growing conditions include things like sunlight and soil moisture. Part of the benefits of native plants is not needing supplemental irrigation once established. But again, that's only true if the right plant is planted in the right place. Is your garden in full sun or part sun? Morning sun is much different than afternoon sun. A lot of times plants will say they can take part sun but that part sun is usually morning sun and not afternoon sun. Afternoon sun is a lot more strong and a lot more intense for certain plants, especially our, um, like our, our ferns, they would prefer morning sun over afternoon sun. I actually run into that problem a lot in my garden where I have strong afternoon sun and not so much morning sun. So I have some fun figuring out which plants would do best. And it took me a couple of years to figure out which plants would do best. Um, so the dapple shade of our native shade trees is a lot different also than the dense shade of Norway maples or the shade of a building or a fence line. Um, so you wanna consider that too. Um, dappled shade is, a, is where a lot of our native understory bushes and shrubs, as well as our ground covers for our woodland ground covers evolved in. They didn't evolve under the dense shade of Norway maples, which really kind of crowd out everything and make it nearly impossible to really grow plants underneath them. So Norway maple is also another invasive. So if you have that growing on your property, consider removing it. And again, you wanna pay attention to your growing extremes. So how much sun does the space get at the peak of the growing season, which is usually June 21, well, always June 21st, the height of summer, the start of summer. Um, how dry is your soil in late summer? So your soil is going to be its driest in like mid to late August when it's the hottest season of the year. It's the hottest month of the year, but it's also when you get the least amount of rain usually, especially as of late, we haven't gotten much rain through the summer. So that is when your soil is going to dry out. So definitely acknowledge if your soil gets excessively dry in late summer and plant accordingly. You don't wanna spend a lot of money on plants that do well all through the spring, but then every summer you have to break out the sprinklers and start baving them again. You want plants that are going to be resilient, that are gonna be as little maintenance involved and as little inputs involved as possible. And you also wanna consider this water pool during the winter months. A lot of plants may do great through the summer and spring and fall, but then winter comes and the water no longer evaporates and kind of sits. And that may rot certain plant species. Um, one species that I have trouble with that is our native Eastern prickly pear cactus. Um, they did great for years and years. And then what happened is now water kind of pools where they were growing in the winter, it kind of sits and it doesn't evaporate too much and the soil stays a little too moist. So they end up getting some rust and some fungus and they, they end up rotting out on me where I originally planted them. So I've moved them from that space. So that's something to consider. You don't want to be planting dry species in the where in the winter it may get too wet and they may rot. So layers, layers is very important. Um, as the saying goes, nature abhors a vacuum. So in a successful native plant garden, 
you will not see soil or mulch in between the plants. You may, see, you know, the first year setting up your garden, yes, you're gonna have mulch in between your plants, but the goal is for those plants to, they will eventually double in size, they will naturalize, whether they naturalize via seed, naturalize via rhizomes, suckers, runners, whichever it is, and eventually you will not have space in between these plants. Um, when you have those openings, that's prime real estate for invasive weeds to infiltrate your planting, and they'll quickly become a maintenance issue for you. So again, the least amount of open space between your plants, the better, because you will have less work to do moving forward. Mulch prevents dormant seeds within the soil from germinating, but it does not prevent windblown seeds or wildlife dispersed seeds from germinating. So even in my garden where you don't see soil, you don't see any ground, you don't see mulch, I will still get invasive species coming and growing into my garden. A lot of times they're brought in by the wildlife that I am attracting because we are surrounded by invasive species and exotic species. So what ends up happening, especially during the winter, the fruit eating birds are left with almost exclusively non-native fruit to eat. So Japanese honeysuckle, barberry, um, porcelain berry, they end up eating that. Um, even mulberry, they'll end up eating the white mulberry in, this, in the summer and bring those seeds in their droppings into my garden where then I have to, I have to be able to acknowledge that new plant and what that plant is. So IDing these plants in your garden is, is, an, is a great, um, the thing to do too is to become familiar with the weeds that do pop up in your garden, whether they're native or non-native, um, so that you can weed properly. Um, so the songbirds do bring in a decent amount of non-native plants in their dropping. So that's why it's also very important to provide them with as much native food sources as possible so that they start dispersing those plants within the environment instead of the exotic plants. So the goal here is to allow your plants to be their own living mulch. You don't need to be putting in mulch every year or every couple of years. So this is layers of a forest garden. This actually took from a permaculture website. Um, most of these plants are not native. Um, so this is just the layering if you happen to have forest conditions. Um, and you can use the sim similar layering also if you want to create forest conditions, obviously, or any other type of garden. So you want to have the tallest tree layer towards the um, north side of your garden. And then as you go more south, you wanna have the lower tree layer. So you may have a black walnut tree. And then below that, you may have either a red bud or a service berry or a dogwood tree. And then under those, you're gonna have your hibish blueberry. And then in the herbaceous layer, you may have um, wild strawberry, columbine, species like that, instead of these non-native species. And then if you have mature trees, which I'm very jealous of you if you have mature trees, feel free to begin planting vines. That's the last thing that starts to grow is the vines up the mature trees. So native grape species, native honeysuckle, um, any of the native vines, native wisteria even, even though it's a little more south than us, but um, just, just definitely use as many of your, the layers as you can in designing your garden and it will definitely look better for you and perform better for you as well as well as bring in as many wildlife as you can so the goal is to mimic a natural plant community layer remember to layer top down as well as front to back so you want to start with your woodies is how i like to start so shrubs and trees they take up the most space and they usually end up casting shade which affects the other plants so definitely start with them figure out where you want to lay those out then plan your rear border Keep the tallest of your plants towards the rear and then bring everything forward as the height decreases. So medium height plants should fill in the center and reserve your low growing species for the front border, but also reserve your low growing species for growing in between your taller species as that living mulch. You can always do that as well. So in my garden, I have wild strawberry acting as the live mulch that grows in between the other plants, but also actually amongst the plants. So as let's use goldenrod as the example, as the goldenrod grows up, if I was to spread that goldenrod, there's a ground layer of wild strawberries growing literally within the goldenrod. So there's many layers in the garden and everything produces something for either insects or songbirds or myself to eat. Oh, so yeah, creating that layering helps people discern that it was planned and that someone took the time to say, this plant belongs here. And it just makes everything look more organized and that there was a plan involved and that it is a maintained space. Um, also feel free to draw it out. So this is actually the Dodge 
pollinated garden that I drew up for um, Rewild. And as you can see, you know, just get a piece of graph paper, measure out your space. If it's, you know, use one unit as a foot and you can just start filling in your plants that way. And that'll definitely help you also get a, you know, a, a tangible plan going on for what you're going to do in your own garden space. So design tips, you wanna start small, you wanna choose groupings of a few species at first, rather than many species, just throwing up the wall to see what sticks. Um, your garden will definitely look better starting with, you know, three, three to five species of, of perennials than it would if you just threw in like 10 or 20 and just to see what happens. Um, and it will look more uniform too, as you plant in mass and odd number groupings and in drifts, with a few species, it'll look a lot more natural, it'll look a lot more uniform, and it'll look a lot more ornamental and formal for you. So you wanna also plant densely. You wanna allow the plants to touch and support each other. 18 inches on center for perennials, you can actually go down to 12 inches. And with even shorter distance, you can go down to six inches if you have plants that are very small or that you want to um, establish a quick ground cover quickly, you can go down to six inches if you really need to. Um, you want to allow the low growing ground covers to fill in the areas between the taller plants, like I mentioned, and you don't want to be afraid of vertical accents. So tall grasses like big blue stem, switchgrass, any thicketing shrubs such as the sumacs and specimen trees. Maybe you want to put a nice clump of red bud or a, a dogwood in the middle of your, your garden. Definitely go for that. It'll look a lot better than if you didn't do it and you add that layer and that um, vertical accent. And it adds a little bit of habitat too when you have that tall grass or that tall shrub that actually provides a lot of nesting opportunity for songbirds. Songbirds, a lot of songbirds don't want to nest tall up in the shade trees. They want to nest in those low growing understory plants, including the shrubs and the tall grasses. You want to plan for multi-season interest, both for people and wildlife. So you want to try to have something blooming from the earliest days of spring through the latest frost to provide color for people as well as nectar and pollen for insects. And you don't want to forget about winter interest. So in the early spring, especially in our woodland settings, we have spring ephemerals, which bloom in March to April, and they will bloom and carry out their entire reproductive and growing season within that short month period. So as soon as the, so they get all of this done while the sun is at its strongest in the spring, and then they go to sleep, they go dormant just in time for the leaf cover of the leaf, of the trees. Once that, once those trees leaf out and they're now they're shaded in, they go to sleep. They don't have that access to the light anymore. Their whole year is done. They reproduce, they did their job and they go to sleep. They're very important for our early emerging spring bees, such as uh, bumblebees. They, um, provide that first source of nectar for them. So trout lilies, Virginia bluebells, any of the wi native willow species. Willows are extremely important for um, our native bees in the spring. They bloom very early from like even late February through early uh, March. So they, they bloom very early. So definitely if you have the room for, prayer, uh, for willows, definitely um, plant some willows and definitely figure out some, some spring ephemerals for yourself as well. Um, for the for the fall, you want to provide asters. You want to provide um, perennial sunflowers. You want to provide some uh, golden rods. Uh, even some. Right now, actually, my only right now I have some. What is it? It's aromatic aster is blooming. It's the last aster to bloom in my garden, and I also have some uh, American witch hazel just started blooming too. So, so that's providing some color and it's also providing some nectar and pollen for any remaining pollinators that may be flitting about. Um, and again, this is a reminder to be aware of your individual plants, how they mature, but also how they reproduce. Some native plants are too aggressive for small suburban gardens. Um, so Canadian goldenrod is an example where most gardeners do, do not have the room for Canadian goldenrod it spreads out very quickly. Um, Brown-eyed Susan is another one, Rebecca triloba. Again, it's not native to, nor uh, to the Northeast, it's native to the Midwest. But again, this one, I started out with one plant, almost half my garden now grows Brown-eyed Susan. It's a very heavy cedar, while the goldenrod, on the other hand, spreads out via rhizomes. So figure out, do the research, figure out how each plant that you're thinking about planting is going to grow and how it's going to reproduce because that's how 
your garden's going to be filled with plants and you want to know if a plant should be substituted with a more well-behaved species versus one that may be more aggressive and aggressive plants are great especially if you have larger areas or if you are combating invasive species you want to use the aggressive species so don't be afraid of aggressive species just know that you don't want them in smaller sized gardens and texture don't forget about texture i almost forgot about texture just now texture is very important it's just as important if not more important than color native grasses are your friend they should be the backbone of your meadow and prairie plantings especially right now in the fall, the prairie grasses are what is stealing the show as everything else is browning out. The prairie grasses are turning shades of red, purple, orange, crimson, especially in this, the angle that the sun is now coming in with the fall. They look spectacular in a, in a planting and through the winter, their seed heads, the textured seed heads of the wildflowers, all that texture is what's going to bring winter interest to your garden besides any berries that may be persisting through the season as well. So maintenance, it's a very common misconception that native plants are no maintenance or low maintenance, but that's not the case. It's definitely a lot less maintenance than a traditional lawnscape. Um, there's no weekly maintenance involved. You don't have to mow, you know, break out the lawn mower and make a ton of noise every week just to uh, maintain your space. Um, but every garden needs to be maintained. That's what makes it a garden and not the wild. Um, you have to maintain it. Human hands have to go in at certain intervals and either spruce it up or weed or, you know, just maintain it a little bit. So the methods differ from conventional maintenance. And instead of weekly maintenance, it's either monthly or seasonal maintenance. Um, and again, familiarize, familiarize yourself with common invasive weeds that may volunteer as well as the native species that pop up on their own. A lot of your plants are going to set, or, you know, they're going to set seed. They're going to drop their seeds. The birds are going to bring in different plants, maybe even if you're lucky than the ones you already bought. And those are free plants. If they're native, let them grow. Um, one species in particular that I let grow wherever it wants to in my garden is yellow wood sorrel. It's a native um, wood sorrel to Long Island. And I didn't plant it. It was always growing here as a quote unquote weed. And many people consider it a weed within their gardens, especially the vegetable gardens. I let it grow because I'd rather that native plant grow and hold space in the garden than a non-native plant possibly anchoring itself and, and growing within the garden. I'd prefer knowing that a native plant is taking that space than having the option of something non-native come in and do it. So definitely learn, become familiar with um, your plants, they look a lot different sometimes than their mature plant. So let's say Rubecchia or Echinacea, those are biennials. So they only bloom their second year. The first year, they'll look a lot different. They'll only be leaves at the ground level. You know, they'll only be leaves at the ground level. They won't be a, a real plant really with stems or anything and shoots. They'll just be at the ground level, little rosettes. If you are familiar with that, then you know not to pull that. And if you do pull it, you can move it somewhere else. If you weren't familiar with that, you'd just be throwing away free plants. So definitely familiarize yourself with the both non-natives and natives that may be volunteering within your garden. Irrigation, most native plants do not need supplemental irrigation past their establishment period. Usually a plant's considered established after it's been in the ground for at least one growing season. Sometimes it takes a little longer um, especially with the woodies, sometimes their roots take a little bit longer to establish, especially if they've been growing in a pot for a long time. Um, again, the right plant for the right place. So the example I give is red cardinal flower. I may do great in average garden soil during the cool rainy spring, but as soon as the summer comes with the heat and the drought, it's going to fail. So unless you're planting that plant in full sun along a pond edge, it's going to fail. Um, so the same can be said for many other species that may do good in dry shade or wet sun, but not dry sun. So learn that about your plants. Do the research for the individual plants. Um, many of our prairie species, for example, like the switchgrass, you know, their roots go down six to eight feet, maybe even more. Um, same with our wild, uh, you know, our, our sunflowers, a lot of our wild perennials, they, their roots grow really deep. There's a few different diagrams online to show exactly how deep the roots go depending on the species. So really you will not have to water most of these plants after a couple of years of establishment unless we have a severe drought. And even then many of the plants will go dormant before they die. But at that point you may want to say, all right, let me break out the sprinkler or the soaker hose and give them a little supplemental irrigation just 
to get through that drought, just so that you know you're not going to lose any money that you spent or any of that hard time and work that you spent. But for the most part, after the first year, you should not be having to water your garden unless you planted the wrong plant in the wrong place. Other tips and tricks, you wanna keep well-defined borders. Borders are probably the most important thing. Um, plants that are flopping over onto your neighbor's driveway or onto the sidewalk, plants that are um, bushes and shrubs that are outgrowing their spaces. You, you don't want that to happen. You want to keep your defined border. So it also helps to do a good delineation of having either a border of stones, bricks, um, maybe like a nice wooden fence, a rail fence, just to show that this is a planned space. I took the time to, to draw up my borders, to maintain my borders. And a lot of times, all you have to do is maintain those borders and the rest of the garden looks fantastic. And that's the only thing you really have to maintain through the growing season. Educational signs, they also help. There's many different national, regional and local um, conservation organizations that are educating and certifying native plant gardens, backyard habitats, um, bee gardens, butterfly gardens, monarch way stations, rewild Long Island gardens. Um, put up the sign, you know, sh represent yourself, represent the, the native plant community and represent what you believe in and what you, you, you want in the world. So by putting that sign out, you don't have to stand out on your, on your front, you know, your front sidewalk and, and tell every single person that passes, this garden looks different than the rest of the neighborhood because it's doing X, Y, and Z. That sign is there to, and to show all the walker buys that what you're doing is important and it's planned and it's purposeful and it's intention, you know, it's intentional. And, and that's, what's important is that at no point, anybody looking at your garden says, this looks like it's unmaintained or this looks like they just stopped mowing their, their lawn. The educational signage helps people understand that your space has a purpose, whether it's for songbirds, whether it's for butterflies, whether it's for pollinators, that allows people to know that there's a purpose. And it also allows them to then go home or whip out their phone and do that research themselves, pull up whatever organization that sign is for, whether it's Rewild, Monarch Way Station, National Wildlife Federation, the Xerces Society, and then do their own research and learn about it themselves and possibly go home and do the same in their own space. Don't be afraid of decorations, statuary or water features. Water features in particular are great for bringing in wildlife, especially like this morning, I have my little bird fountain, my little bird pond going on right now. I have bullfrogs in it. Um, I get songbirds all the time come. I have a little heater through the winter as well. So running water is great for both attracting songbirds and other wildlife, but also it's great for people. It allows us to kind of relax. It drowns out a little bit of the industry that's happening uh, in the rest of our suburbs that really shouldn't be happening. Um, you know, a lot of industrial noise between cars, machinery, everything. So water definitely helps. And also again, statuary decorations and water features, they help other people who aren't familiar with what they're seeing understand that someone took the time to not only plan this, but then went in and decorated it and added these special features that complete the space so that there's never that misconception that what am I looking at? It's always, this is a planned garden. It may not be the garden that I thought of when I think of a garden, but this is someone's planned garden. Um, so yeah, so all of these help people understand that you're growing a planned and maintained garden and it's intentional. So tips and tricks, don't cut back your plants in the fall. You wanna leave them standing to provide seeds for songbirds and overwintering sites and shelter for beneficial insects and other wildlife. Those stalks also help um, insulate your plants through the winter and shelter them from extreme shifts in temperature. So definitely leave your plants standing through the winter. Um, you have to rethink what is ornamental to a little degree. Um, you know, fall cleanups, we just rip everything out and you just have bare ground, um, leaving these stems and these seed heads provides habitat for all this wildlife, but it also is very ornamental, especially once you get a little frost like this morning or a light snowfall. Um, you know, there's nothing as ornamental as like a seed head with just snow on it like that. And, and you'll see as, as the weather progresses and um, you guys start gardening yourself, you'll start appreciating the different seasons in your garden a lot more than 
you would have if it was just a barren lawn and an empty garden every winter. Um, so again, you want to stay abstain from the fall and spring cleanups. You want to try to keep the leaf litter and other debris where it falls. Uh, a lot of our beneficial insects are living within those dead stalks. A lot of our beneficial insects are living on our leaves. They're either overwintering as eggs or cocoons or even adults in the leaf litter, both on the ground and within the trees. Um, if you if you have too much patio space or it's on your driveway, you can collect all those leaves and relocate it to your beds. Um, you can also mow it directly into any lawn areas. At that point, you may be limiting how much beneficial insects persist in that leaf litter because you're gonna be shredding it up and chopping it up with a machine. But um, at least you're recycling those nutrients where you're not shipping them off, you know, wasting more carbon emissions to ship them to a facility to, for processing. At least you process them at your own home. You either put them through a shredder or a mower, and then you can use that either in your vegetable beds or straight onto your lawn areas or just anywhere else within your garden. It just helps, shredding the leaves helps um, for people who have too many leaves for their beds, but otherwise just leave the leaves wherever you can and let nature take its course. They provide a whole bunch of habitat and you'll be able to see too, you'll be able to observe the songbirds come in through the winter and they'll throw the leaves over, you know, pick out any worms, pick out any isopods or other insects that may be under the leaf litter. It also helps insulate again, the plants from extreme shifts in temperature through the winter. Um, so you wanna do cut back last year's growth finally in April, late April. So you wanna leave 18 to 24 inches of stem standing for our native stem nesting bees and other beneficial insects. Um, when you start doing this over the years, you will start noticing, you will see predatory insects and arachnids a lot earlier every year than you have in years past. Um, and what that means is you're supporting predatory species in your garden to the point where you will not be having an outbreak of any pest species because the population of predatory species is already at a high enough level from the get-go in early spring to provide that pest control for you. So you'll also be able to observe as soon as you cut back those stems in late April, these little tiny stem nesting bees zipping in and out of those little stems and nesting. And that's, especially switchgrass is my favorite because you cut that back and then switchgrass doesn't start to grow until about June, late May, early June when it starts to really heat up. So that whole month of after you cut it back, you get to just observe unabated all these insects using those hollow stems and you make the connection that if I didn't do this and if I had cut this down all the way to the ground, like everybody else does with their ornamental grasses, this habitat wouldn't be here, these bees would not be here, and then these bees would not be functioning within the ecosystem. So what you do is immediately measurable to these insects as habitat. Um, so tall species, late summer and fall bloomers, they all can and should be cut back at least once around the 4th of July. And that mimics animal browsing and also mimics a environmental disturbance such as a wildfire coming through. Um, historically, most ecosystems, especially in North America, evolved with some sort of disturbance, whether it is a herd of animals coming in and grazing or browsing the plants, or if it's a seasonal wildfire coming through after a lightning storm and, you know, burning everything down. So this will prevent flopping once things begin to bloom, because your plants will, instead of growing straight up, they'll end up branching out once you cut them back like that. Um, certain species, it can take a little, you know, there's a little bit of learning curve. Um, I'm always hesitant to cut back by two thirds, but don't be afraid. Definitely cut back by two thirds. You can even cut certain plants back again later on in the season if they begin to get too tall for you. Um, another common thing that people do is they pinch the tips. Many people who grow asters, if you're familiar with asters, They'll pinch the tips until June. This is similar where instead of taking the time every week to pinch the tips, you just come in once and cut it back. Um, it's a little simpler for me, a little easier to remember in my opinion than to pinch every week to, to get more flowers. So you get the same thing. You get more flowers by cutting back and you also get brand, you know, more branching and a more sturdier plant in the end, the end game. So, and don't be afraid to ask for help. There are vibrant native plant communities online, Facebook, um, these include Rewild Long Island, the Long Island Native Plant Garden Group, which uh, I created. Um, Rewild Long Island and Dropsy Native Landscapes, as we already mentioned, are partnered now with 
providing you with guided rewilding assistance. Um, I offer consultations and designs to help anyone in need of it to get their gardens growing, you know, get the plants in the ground, get the gardens growing, get um, the wildlife coming in. And, you know, just so people can, can, you know, increase their biodiversity right where they stand and, and appreciate nature for what it is and, and to show others that we can exist, we can coexist with wildlife. It doesn't have to be, you know, humanity lives here and nature exists, you know, in the mountains upstate. It can be, I step out my front door and I'm met by, you know, 10 different species of songbirds, you know, five different species of butterflies and who knows how many species of bees flying around the flowers. So definitely ask for help. Someone will help you, whether it's us or just, you know, another person online. Don't be afraid to ask for help. And there's a bunch of further reading. Um, so Bringing Nature Home is by Douglas Tallamy. Douglas Tallamy is the, he's considered the father of this movement. Um, he is a professor, I forget which college he works with. Um, he's a professor at one of the universities. Uh, he- University of Delaware. Delaware, okay, thank you. He, um, he authored Bringing Nature Home. Nature's Best Hope was the, the sequel, I guess, to that book. And then he also co-authored The Living Landscape, Designing for Beauty and Biodiversity. Um, so that's another great book. Those three books are definitely worth reading if you have the time. Um, and, and it will also definitely, that those books, the first two especially, will um, educate you on exactly how interconnected all of this stuff is, because it's just amazing how interconnected you know, the, the environment is with the plants. And it's like, as soon as you add these plants into your garden, you will have wildlife coming and you will have the butterflies, you will have the bees, you will have the songbirds. Many times I'm planting out plants for somebody and they're watching me through the window and the butterflies fly in. I'll get monarch butterflies, just they catch the sniff of the, the flowers on the air and they come right in as I'm putting the plants in the ground and the face on the clients, you know, th their look on their face is like amazed because it's like, it's instantaneous. The, um, you know, it's instantaneous to, to when you put these plants out, the wildlife just comes right in. So a new garden ethic by Benjamin Voigt. Um, I'm actually wearing his shirt. He's out West. He does a lot of um, prairie restoration for homeowners. He um, does a lot of great work. And he, again, um, if you, find him online you can buy his book read his book um, definitely brush up on on his thought process as well for for planting with native plants um, planting in a post wild world is another great one by thomas renair and great natives for tough places is a book by the brooklyn botanical garden um, it's an oil regions guide but i figured it's nice that the brooklyn botanical garden took the time to write up that book and i figured the sales help um, you know support the the native the, the brooklyn botanical garden and their native plant garden that they have there um, some, we'll talk about it in full as we go forward with the Q&A, but um, Rewild Long Island is a great source for information as well as native plants. The Long Island Native Plant Initiative is another great uh, organization on Long Island that goes out, collects seeds from our native plants, and then propagates those local ecotype plants for Long Island homeowners to grow out in their gardens. So they are very important in preserving our natural history right on Long Island so that you're buying ecotype plants from Long Island and you're not buying ecotypes from the Midwest where you may, which is what happens when you purchase plants online. Um, so we'll talk about the different re uh, the different sources for, for finding native plants, but I just wanted to touch on those two local organizations that, um, cause we actually, Rewild will actually sell the Limpy plants when the time comes as well. So that we are a way to get those plants to do as well. So this is the end of my presentation. And I think we're going to be taking questions now. I uh, know, uh, we will just uh, just give me a second. And sure. uh, one very quick thing. So I wanna talk about the services expand and elaborate on what Anthony talked about in terms of uh, consulting services. Uh, but uh, before I do that, just uh, I always like to put this up, progress, not perfection, always, right? I mean, think about doing something a little bit better. Don't get overwhelmed. You don't have to do it all at once. <laughs> and trust me, none of us are, you know, uh, all of us have our favorite uh, non-natives as well on our gardens. So for those of you that are new and possibly, oh my God, this is a lot of change. You can always start with the island garden. You can always start small. You can always uh, move things. I mean, you know, if you're replacing a lawn and you're putting in a plant that 
may not be perfectly native, but on the other hand, it provides a lot of the environmental benefits, please go ahead. It's always about trying to do something, a step each, each gardening season, doing a little bit better and a little bit more. And to that end, right? I mean, always the question is, how do I make that progress? Um, so that's why we offer this program. Uh, you're happy to partner with uh, Anthony on this. Um, so this is offered to all members. So you have to get a Riva Long, Long Island membership for uh, membership in order to avail of it. But basically, um, there's, the first one is a yard consultation where Anthony will walk through your yard and write out his observations and recommendations. Well, after he does that or during the visit or even before, if you decide, oh, you know what? I want Anthony to design a garden for me. Then the garden design is an added consultation service on top of that. Or you may have a full yard like Nina talked about. So you had at least two or three other people who are moving into new homes or having a home completely redone or uh, any in, in one way, shape or form, uh, uh, rethinking their surroundings then you want to go for a full yard consultation. This includes right, trees as well as shrubs, as well as how you're using your water, as well as organic gardens. I mean, it's really thinking your entire yard from a sustainability or a permaculture perspective. Uh, Anthony is of course a certified permaculture expert. So definitely uh, any one of these things you can go. And I just drew up a little flow chart here simply because I tend to think in flow charts. <laughs> so, um, so they start by becoming a member for 2021. I mean, again, our memberships either $50 or we encourage volunteers. So if you have six volunteer of ours, we will give you a free membership and still encourage you to pay, donate what you can, but still uh, that's that's way to become a member. Then you can get a yard consultation for $100 at that point in time or soon after, ideally if at that point in time, you let Anthony know uh, that you know, either you just want the report. So in which case, great, you get a report with um, a lot of uh, questions answered, as well as uh, some of the recommendations that Anthony will give based on what he sees in your yard. Um, the second is, if you at that point decide to go for a garden design, you know that uh, you can you can see. So you designate the area where you want the garden. And Anthony will not only give you your consulting report, but also give you a design that is uh, appropriate for your garden with the species and the number of plants you may need and so on and so forth. Um, or you can say, I want to go for a full yard design. And anyway, he's gone through the walkthrough. Then you have multiple iterations with Anthony where you go through and entirely re-envision your entire yard over the winter. Now, all of this starts with before Anthony gets to your site, Please walk through your own yard, put down all your questions on pieces of paper so you don't forget anything. So you're like walking through as a fully informed customer. And what we want to do with all of this is it's not a one set done. The reason we are doing it over winter is so that you can do your own research in the background. You may have specific concerns of child friendly or dog friendly or this or that. So do your own research and you will have a successful garden if you know your plants and weeds, as Anthony says, so the more research you do, the more successful your know, gardening experience is going to be. Um, and I'm just gonna say, and, and being a Rewild member, there's a whole bunch of benefits when we uh, sell plants in uh, uh, spring. Uh, you know, we give usually people a discount on that and discount on the fall sales. So between buying plants and helping an organization, a lot of it just um, pays for itself. And, you know, uh, a nascent organization like ours definitely needs the help. Right, so this is kind of how we see this working. Right now we are at the kickoff, which is the last week of November, October. Uh, we'll start scheduling initial site visits for Fridays and Saturdays in November. Anthony's already gotten the first bunch of uh, people who signed up and, and he's scheduling. Now, the reason this program works the way it does is because if we, we can make it more cost affordable by the fact that Anthony is traveling to a cluster of people rather than traveling up and down for each individual person. So the sooner you sign up, the more we can form the clusters, you can get your dates and you can be productive uh, for Anthony to come in and do it. Uh, and then we'll do, you know, over December and January, you can go back and forth and depending on the service, right? Get, get more knowledge and information, ask your questions. Uh, over December, January, we'll finalize designs by March, especially for the full yards where it may be a little bit more complex. Um, 
And then we'll start in April, we'll start doing the site prep and group mulching. Uh, it's optional, you can participate or not. And then same thing, plant the purchases uh, by mid-May, and then you start planting soon after. So that's kind of how we are thinking about this planning and um, planting process will work. So there's plenty of time, it's, it's very slow and deliberate, and you can take your time to think, educate yourself, uh, and, and, and plant. So, so that's, that's, that's how we are thinking about the program. Uh, you, of course, go to www.revilelongisland.org and, uh, and you know, click on the higher X, but fill out the registration form if you have not done so. Once you're registered, Anthony will start scheduling appointments. Once your appointment is scheduled is when we'll ask you to pay. Um, so till then, you know, go ahead, put it in everything. And then again, the payment we are asking people to do first the consultation and then decide what they want to do from that point on. So you're, you know, you don't have to stress about the early design decisions. You come in, talk to Anthony, see what he can do for you and then uh, go ahead and decide how you want to proceed. So, so let me pause there. Any questions? So now we'll take questions. We'll, either you can put them in the chat or you can come off mute and uh, ask away. So, okay, go ahead. Go ahead, go ahead. I had a few questions. Anthony, hi. It's nice to finally quasi meet you. Um, as you know, I can. A ton of my front lawn this year, very exciting because it was so much fun every morning to go out with a cup of coffee and see all the wildlife and monarchs and you name it. So that was wonderful. So I'm, I'm you know, I have my first year behind me just about um, and I have some questions. So sure. it, it was a pretty big area and I bought a lot of plants. I'm going to be stratifying some seeds and you know, planting and more, but there was a lot of weeding this year, you know. Um, the plants are, most of them, not all of them, are, are probably more than 18 inches off center. Do you think I should, you know, it's it gets expensive. So do you think I should just keep adding in, adding in, adding in? Like, in, because you know, the first year is the roots, second year is shoots. How does that go? You know, it takes a while to really, to get going so that it looks like your beautiful garden, which I look at all the time for inspiration. So yeah. Um, so. You could start by seed, by seed, like you said, you're gonna start stratifying some seeds. So that's a good way to save a lot of money. Um, also, as long as you have some, so, since you went about 18 inches, a little bit more, if you have mulch in between those for now, it's okay. As long as those plants, as they mature, they'll start to fill in the spaces. Add more seeded plants in, like if you're seeding out plants yourselves, definitely you know do that, and you can fill in the spaces with those plants that you germinated yourself. Um, also, know that a lot of the plants that you leave standing now, if they flowered, they will drop those seeds as the birds yeah. come in. So you'll get some volunteers next spring as well. Um, the only other thing I can say is also try to get some plants um, that you know are going to naturalize by spreading out, um, either with like rhizomes or or or. Um, like a wild strawberry, like if Fragaria virginiana, like that's a great one where I actually have that in every bed in my in my garden. All my gardens have wild strawberry as as a great ground cover, um, because it's just you. Do, I don't have to do anything, you know. I don't need to water it. I don't need to to do anything. I get berries every every year. My nephew comes and picks the berries straight out of the garden. You know, the birds come that's pick great. the berries out of the garden. Um, so and that what that'll do is you could start off with like a few of those, and those will send out runners and. You know, fill in all those empty spaces where you're just fine. Um, get things that creep. Get things so like Virginia creeper is a nice one. Um, just be careful with Virginia creeper because it will, you know, start growing up things eventually. Yeah. So you don't want it to grow up your house or you know up a tree that's too small. Um, I don't know your growing conditions. If you have sun, like creeping phlox is another great one. It's full sun, and I do have a ton okay. of creeping phlox. Yeah, yeah, just let that creeping phlox, you know, grow in, and you can even plant that creeping phlox in between your taller plants, like I mentioned earlier, okay. and that will be your mulch. That will be your ground layer, and you'll have that great evergreen ground cover that flowers in the spring, and just let them, you know, spread in between your plants, and that's how that plant actually would exist in nature. It would exist as that ground hugging, creeping mat growing in between taller plants, such as prairie grasses and some flowering perennials. Okay, what's the name for wild strawberries? What's the Latin name? Fragaria, I'll type it out for you, Virginiana. So Fragaria, Virginiana. Fragaria, okay. I, I have it, Anthony. 
It's okay. Um, I'm gonna ask. I'm gonna answer Alex's que Alexa's question. Um, wood chips instead of mulch. Um, yes, wood chips can be mulch just as just as fine. I actually prefer fresh wood chips or a little aged wood chips compared to baked mulch at the stores, um, just because there's no dye or anything else in um, wood chips. A lot of times you can actually call tree services and just ask them to dump their chips on your driveway because that's one less expense they have dumping at the dump. So you can explain to them you want, you know, just plain wood chips, no like vines mixed in. And a lot of times you'll get, you'll luck out and it's like they just came down the block and chopped down a white pine and they come to your house and just leave it for you on your driveway and you get some free mulch that way for you to start your beds. So I have a few questions as well. Um, I live in Flower Hill, Manhasset and the country estates development, which was created in the late fifties, um, the developer stripped all of the topsoil off the entire acreage and sold it so that they could make some money. So I'm always in need of additional topsoil. I have a huge compost system and uh, mulch from Rewild, but I need topsoil as well. I'm, I have bought topsoil in the past, but I'm concerned about where it comes from and what it contains. So do you have any reliable source for topsoil that's not contaminated? Um, what's that one company? Um, I think it's called Long Island Compost. Long Island Compost, I know, is a good company that's local on Long yes, Island. They, um, they, yeah, they yeah, sell to a lot of the very stores. Expensive in terms of yeah. Otherwise, delivery. just take your time and you can build your own topsoil. Well, I have you have to... thirty years, but I still don't. Have <laughs> all you got to do is um, you know, just just leave the leaves fall chop and drop all your plants and even through the growing season you can go in and continually chop your plants down and let them regrow and all that biomass as it accumulates and then decomposes is, is creating fresh topsoil for you so that's another way you can build topsoil especially with faster growing species like grasses just going in periodically through the growing season and chopping them down and letting that fall where it wherever it falls let it just sit and that'll break down into more topsoil for you over time um yeah, otherwise I wouldn't even worry about it too much. Are you having problems because you don't have the topsoil or? Well, just in terms of, of the quantity that, that I need, for example, I, I want to take some of my lawn and turn it into an island garden. Okay. I don't have enough existing mulch from leftover from April and the compost I want to put in, I have huge vegetable beds. Okay. Um, so I have a whole farm in the back. I mean, I, I'm going to have you come and Okay, look. yeah, sounds good, but, sounds good. But, um, but topsoil is something that uh, I don't have enough of. All those things that talk about chopping up or whatever, I put in my compost pile, maybe I should. Okay, yeah, yeah. Oh, but, all right, so I understand then that. So you're looking for more topsoil then to layer on, are you gonna do like a sheet mulching type situation? Yes, exactly. Okay, so you want more topsoil to layer on top. Um, yeah, then at that point, I guess you're just gonna have to buy some topsoil. Um, yeah, no, no, I'm really, I, yeah. I, I've <laughs> worked with Long Island Compost, but they charge, a lot of money for delivery because they yeah. come out east. So okay. I'm wondering, Raju, if we couldn't do a topsoil, uh, rewild topsoil group purchase as well uh, at some well, point. We've, uh, we have, uh, let's put out a query. If there are enough people in the area that want to do that, that makes perfect sense. Uh, we, we can absolutely do that. But I, I, you know, to your point, I really want to make sure, see with mulch, we have taken the time to figure out a good source where they will give us like good, you know, clean, uh, whatever, un undyed uh, natural um, hardwood mulch. Um, we need to do the same for topsoil, and if we can find, you know, if this if, if this works out, absolutely. Okay, super, super. Um, I know that, you know, we, we have to do our own research, and I've been doing research for as long as I can remember, but there are certain things that I would love to have a guidebook. So, for example, I can't tell when a plant is just first coming up what it is. I have to wait until it's so big that it's clearly a weed or so big that it's clearly not a weed. Uh, do you know any source where we can identify things when they're small? Um, so there, there's a lot of um, apps on your phone now that you can download um, on your smartphone that you can just take a picture and it will a lot of times they they work out pretty well where they'll tell you, at least give you a few options, even if they're wrong, they'll at least give you a few options for then you to go 
and look at each plant individually and say, all right, it looks like this one more than this one. So maybe it's this one. Um, but- um, You have a specific one you like? I think I, what is it? Like, I think some people use Google, Google Lens. Other people use, let me see, Plant ID app. I'll look it up for you real quick. Yeah, um, plant ID, I mean- Plant nap, plant, plant net, leaf snap, plant snap, iNaturalist, seek. I, 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 I've used some of them, but not so necessarily great success. Yeah. Is there I, one that you love? I use um, iNaturalist and I really like it. I think okay, yeah, a lot of people use iNaturalist. Yeah. Otherwise, um, if you're on Facebook, there's a lot of groups. Um, you know, our Facebook group in Help ID, Long Island Native Plant uh, Gardening Group. Um, there's a lot of um, native plants of the Northeast, native plants of New England, um, native plants of Eastern North America. All these are Facebook groups where all you got to do is upload your picture with the location and um, they'll provide you with an answer. They'll help you figure that out for you. Yeah, I think it's unfortunately time for me to get onto Facebook. I have. <laughs> I know time. it's one of those things where it, it, there's the community though is, is so great where I'm, you know, I'm not a good, I'm not a big fan of Facebook itself, but just for community purposes yeah. and sharing that education and sharing that knowledge, it really is a great tool that, yeah. I, that I'm, I'm using, utilizing it. So definitely, you know, look into signing up on Facebook and, and joining some groups and, and sharing what you find around. Yeah. I, a lot of the things that, um, in theory could be native have existed since I bought the house but how can you tell if a if a honeysuckle or a rudbeckia that you have growing for all these years how can you tell if that one is native okay so the only rudbeckia well it depends on who you look at um so the only rudbeckia native to new york is rudbeckia lassianata which is native upstate it's not really native down here um and that looks completely different than a black eyed Susan. It looks more like a cone flower and it's a lot taller. It's like eight feet tall, it can grow. That was actually grown as a leafy green crop for by the Native Americans and you can still grow it and eat it as you want. Um, New York, no, is it New York? No, the Bonat maps actually show that Rudbeckia herta, which is the biennial species as being native to New York. But if you go in the New York Flora Atlas, it says that it's not native. So it can get a little confusing depending on which um, which website you're using and which map you're looking at, which, you know, um, that's why I don't recommend using the USDA maps anymore because the, the plant database for the USDA is very confusing. The maps are out of date. The counties may show that it's native when it's not. Um, I made a few mistakes myself planting out Midwestern plants that it said were native to New York, but they really weren't using the, the database, the plants database from the USDA. Um, a lot of it's just trial and error. Like I said, but the Rebecca especially don't worry so much because they do attract and support. Um, yeah. What was I mean, the word I used? You know, generalist value. pollinators. Yeah, they support generalist pollinators. So they're great to add in some showiness to your garden. Don't stress so much about those. Um, you know, even in the grand scheme of things, most people say to aim for two thirds. Like even Doug Tallamy says aim for two thirds. Two thirds of the plants being native and the other third being non-native, non-invasive species. So having a Rudbeckia that's from the Midwest is gonna be better than any plant from Europe or, or Asia. So don't stress so much about if the Rudbeckia is well, native or not. I have European and Asian plants too, so. Yeah, so <laughs> just try yeah, to limit those. And these gardens, so I mean. Yeah, it gets tough, it gets yeah, tough. Yeah, it's so. tough, it's tough, but. Um, Okay, I mean, Limpy also will sell you um, Echinacea purpurea. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. So, I don't know I where mean, they found those. So, I mean, if they, you know, and they are, I consider, you know, one of the high standards. Yes. This is the See, first time I've heard that this is something we shouldn't be planting. Yeah, so, yeah, it, it, it can get tricky. Um, so actually, my, I'll use pale purple coneflower, which is Echinacea pallida. The, the USDA plants database says that that's native to Suffolk County. That's not native to Suffolk County. It's not native to New York at all. It's native to the Midwestern states, um, the South Midwestern states too, no less. So, you know, it, it's, you got to find a good source for the maps. That's why I recommended the New York Floor Atlas and I recommended the Bonat maps. And you can just go in and type in the botanical name and it'll show you where, the, where it's documented to be growing naturally. And then, um, you know, use Google and type in the botanical name. And if you're not sure of what you're looking at, you know, you can type in like first year Echinacea purpurea and it'll show you the first year form versus one that's flowering. So you know that you're looking at a first year volunteer and then you know whether or not you want to pull it or, or, or let it grow. 
Yeah. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Um, okay. Anyone else? I don't think anyone typed anything. Anyone yeah. else have a question? Anthony, do you can you give other examples of what we should pinch back or uh, you know take off by two thirds? Okay. So a lot of people actually, which is new for me this year because I never did it before. Um, a lot of people will actually pinch back their summer bloomers. They'll pinch the tips, so the right. growing tips. They'll pinch those back until about Mother's Day or July first too. Where uh, July, yeah, July fourth or first, um, and they'll tip, they'll pinch those tips back because you end up with more flowers. So even the rudbeckia, if you're growing rudbeckia or you're growing heliopsis, they'll tip those back, they'll pinch the tips. Just so you end up with more terminal buds and you okay. get more flowers. When did you do that again? So usually they say stop doing that around July 4th. Okay. So either way, you don't want to be cutting things past July 4th because at that point we're losing light and you're going to end up, you know, losing the plants through the growing season. You may delay the flowering so much that um it, it's not beneficial but how but at that so the rods, yeah so the taller stuff like joe pie weed um perennial sunflowers like helianthus um you want to cut uh even goldenrod you want to cut that back to july 4th around july 4th by two-thirds you want to do a hard cut back by two-thirds around july 4th so that way they grow back and they bush out instead of growing extra tall and then flopping once their blooms get too heavy Take off two thirds or leave two thirds? Take off how much? Two thirds. You want to take head shears and just cut down two thirds down the stems of the plant. Thank you. Or even like a weed whacker, if you have a large property with a weed whacker, just go through and cut everything down, you know, two thirds of, of a tight at that moment. Almost everything. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You, and like I said, you could do that too. Like I said, a lot of these plants, yeah, it's hard to do, but a lot of these plants require that. And even plants such as um, Monarda, like Bee Bomb gets, gets the, the downy mildew where you get the white yeah. on the leaves, you can cut that back. Once those plants bloom and then you start seeing the mildew uh, form, cut them back by two thirds, let new leaves and shoots grow and those leaves won't have that downy mildew on them anymore because they'll be fresh. I still have some in my garden that has downy mildew. Um, yeah, at this point it's, it's just whatever. It, it, it's only aesthetic. Um, but should I take it away so you don't have as much disease? No, no it, it, it's not really an issue. It's more of a seasonal thing. It's, um, it's, it's, it's environmental. It's 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 humidity and airflow. So right. you can always go in in the spring. And if you have a native plant that you know gets down any mildew, either you can prune some stems out so that it's a little more open, or you can do that cut back after the downy mildew seems to have like really taken over the plant. You can cut that back and then let it regrow. Um, the, with the cut back pieces, even though it has downy mildew, I still leave that as a as a living mulch. You could. Um, you could remove it if you want. You could compost it if you want. Otherwise, I would just leave it. You know, I don't worry about it too much because, again, it's only aesthetic, the downy yeah. mildew. Yeah, um, we're not talking about anything like rust or anything. Um, and also, even ladybugs will eat downy mildew spores. So, oh. you know, they all play a part in it, you know. So, you know, it's it's up to you at that point. Okay. I have to go. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Nice Bye. meeting you, finally. Uh, I know uh, everybody, a lot of people have to go. Uh, so, can Andy, maybe you can put question? down... Please go ahead. No problem. I'm so sorry. Um, so I have a seeding area that now has grass underfoot, but I would like to have something native and something beneficial underfoot instead. It's not a huge, it's about, oh, I don't know, 900 square feet. Um, what can I plant there that you can walk on? I mean, nobody's playing soccer there. It's just when we sit and, and talk, that would be native and beneficial is if micro clover is micro clover an option or is so so micro so all clovers there's no clovers native to the northeast we have a few bush clovers native to the northeast but there are no clovers native to the that northeast was not what I was um so clover is what i like to call a lesser of two evils where i will tell people if you have to grow a lawn and they're so adamant about growing a lawn I say, fine just be sure you grow some clover in with it because the clover fixates nitrogen so that clover fertilizes the lawn instead of them having to apply fertilizer, which then runs off in our water. Um, the other thing with clover is it, you know, even though it's not a native plant, it does act as bee fodder, especially for bumblebees where they'll come in and, and forage on the, bee, on the, on the flowers. Um, depending on your growing conditions, if you have a lot of, do you have a lot of sun? It's sunny there. It, it is shaded by dappled shade with uh, a wild cherry tree. That's there. Okay. Then I would recommend a mix of, um, you could do a mix of like Pennsylvania sedge, maybe a couple other native sedges, 
So the genus for them is Carex. Um, yeah. You know, but but there's native sed there's sed there's sedges but that are also taller than being able to walk on. So so, so do uh, I Pennsylvania sedge, Pennsylvania sedge, it grows very slowly. Um, it, if you don't mow it at all, it'll grow and kind of like do a nice little flop over and be very wispy, and you can still walk through it. Otherwise, you can mow it once or twice a year to keep it at a manageable walkable level. So that's the thing with the with the native turf alternatives, where if you wanted to leave them, they would grow and be like a nice naturalistic, wispy, flowing type growth. Otherwise, you can mow them back and still have them look maintained. And you only have to mow them once or twice a year. And then you can use, you know, the space for walking as you see fit. Um, like I just got rid of the last bit of, of exotic turf lawn in my property. And I put in a mix of short beak sedge, um, Bicknell sedge and uh, purple lovegrass because those are two sedges that can take heat and sun. Most sedges like shade or moist conditions. So those two take heat in the sun and the purple lovegrass is another native grass that um, stays short, can be mowed on, can be mowed, can be walked on. And then when it does flower in the summer, it creates these clouds of purple. Yeah, flowers. I, I so, bought one. I bought one recently as a as a specimen plant because yeah it had like a little area would exactly fine. yeah so. i didn't think of it as you know in a broad area oh they look great especially so, you can definitely observe them too along the parkway this time of year a month or so ago if you observe them on the parkway they look great in mass with just a purple um you know that cloud of purple and that's how you know and they get mowed at least twice a year on the side of the parkway so that's how i know you can mow them you can walk on them you can do what you need to and and that's why I recommend a mix because you don't want to just put all Pennsylvania sedge because if the Pennsylvania sedge doesn't take where it's too sunny, you want another sedge or, or another grass to come in and fill that space then and, and take in and take over that empty space where the other plant can't survive. So if I, if I sheet mulch this now, do I plant those in the spring? Or yeah, you could, I if you sheet mulched it now, you could plant them in the spring. If you really wanted to, you could probably plant them now. Like if you sheet mulch today, you could probably plant those next week and they'd be just fine. Um, especially the sedges, because sedges are the other benefit of planting a mix with sedges and grasses is that sedges tend to be cool season growing. So they will grow in the spring and the fall, while the grasses tend to be warm season grasses, where the purple love grass doesn't green up until the sedges start to go dormant for the summer. So they'll green up in June, but the sedges green up in April and, 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 and May. So this is a seed mix you're talking about. No, um, they do sell mixes, but for the most part, no, I'm talking about just getting a few flats of plugs and just letting them, you know, and, and plant them out where you want them. And sedges spread underground. So they'll fill in that space over a, a year or so, depending on how densely you plant. And they'll fill in and form a nice carpet. Um, if you started from seed, it would take a lot longer. It'd be a lot more difficult. Um, you know, it can be a little cost prohibitive sometimes because you do want to plant as densely as you can. You'll have 900 square feet. We're talking about- Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, but if you're going to call me, I can always help you out and, and price yeah. that out for you to figure out exactly what source is best for what you need. Because that, that's where it comes down to too. Sometimes, right. it's, sometimes it helps to order away at a wholesale nursery for, for little plugs that are two inches wide compared to going out to a local um, grower who only sells plants that are four inches or, you know, little, little pints or something like that save yourself money and you can get more plants for your buck and you can plant them out and get better results.